Good day, everyone. My name is Brian Prophet from the Open Source Programming Program Office, welcoming you to another edition of Community Central. We're very happy to, to be starting a new series within Community Central, highlighting some of the work that uh, Red Hat has been uh, involved with and helping out with as part of their Team 19 efforts. And to kickstart that off, we're going to be talking about a new, a really cool new program called COVIDNet. Um, before I introduce our two guests today, I definitely want to do the usual housekeeping. Um, as you know, um, there are there will be a Q and A section after the presentation today. If you make sure you use the Q and A um, session um, uh, tool, we'll be able to get your questions answered in the order in which they were received and also how they've been voted. So definitely want to take advantage of that tool and uh, interact with our two guests today, whom I'm pleased to uh, introduce. So today we have Alex Wong and Melissa Wrench, um, both coming out of the COVID net team and also affiliated with the University of Waterloo in Canada. So Alex and Melissa, welcome to you both today. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Yeah, thank All you so right. much well, for having us. That's great. So if you're ready to get started, jump right on in. Thank you so much. So I'm, we're very happy to be here to talk about our project called COVIDNet, which is an open source deep learning initiative for COVID-19 detection and risk stratification from chest uh, radiography. So I'm uh, Alex. I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo, also Canada Research Chair in the area of AI and medical imaging. Uh, as well as I'm also a chief scientist for Darwin AI, uh, which is a startup focused on deep learning in uh, Waterloo, Canada. And we also have Melissa here. And so what we'll do is I'll first give an introduction as well as a motivation and what we do. And then Melissa is gonna go into deeper details between our collaboration uh, with Red Hat. So just to give a quick you know, introduction, uh, this really doesn't need too much introduction. Uh, we're all very aware of the COVID-19 pandemic that's going around the world right now. And even looking at the current image that I have on the dashboard from the John Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard, this is already very much out of date because the cases continue to rise. And one of the biggest problems here is not only has it been spreading very rapidly, but it's also a null virus that we have not experienced before with very limited treatment options and currently no official vaccines. And so this becomes very problematic. And one of the key first steps in COVID uh, management is screening, which is very paramount with the fight against COVID-19. And so one of the gold standards right now that's being used is uh, RT-PCR testing, which is your standard viral testing. It has very high specificity, but it also is very time consuming. In many situations, you end up getting results back after a day, as uh, long as I've heard was also seven, almost seven days. And it's also very lab intensive pr uh, process in a lot of different countries. And there's still a shortage uh, in the availability of testing. And But more importantly, even with RT-PCR testing, while it's the gold standard, there's actually a varying degree of sensitivity depending on where you swab be it in your mouth, be it through the nostrils, you could actually have different levels of sensitive performance. And not only that, it has been shown in recent studies that the positive rate for detection goes down as symptom onset. So as the symptom continues to progress within a person, it becomes harder and harder to detect. And so there's been a lot of attention now that has also looked into antibody tests that are significantly faster, takes minutes to get results, and also have high specificity. And people have been looking into this to help uh, pretty much open up the uh, economy. Uh, but one of the biggest problems right now with uh, some of the uh, antibody tests are is that the uh, sensitivity is actually quite poor. In fact, based on a recent study from the National COVID uh, Scientific Advisory Panel in the UK, they stated based on their tests that currently available commercial devices do not perform sufficiently well for individual patient applications in which case there's been a lot of delays in deploying such uh, antibody testing to reopen the economy. So what can we actually do to complement this? So what we've been looking into, as well as a lot of other people have been leveraging in clinical systems, has been the use of chest radiography, which is a complementary screening approach that has a lot of different advantages. So first of all, it really enables rapid triaging. So 
taking x-rays are actually very fast, very rapid uh, ac acquisition is possible. It can also be done in parallel to viral testing, so clinicians and frontline workers can have a much better idea with what they're dealing with before the test results even come back. And one of the key things about chest radiography is that it's often done on patients with respiratory complaint regardless. So in which case, if we're going to take it anyways, might as well leverage it as a complementary screening tool. And not only that, it's also highly accessible, has low cost and low maintenance, pretty much ready to available in most clinical sites. It's in fact standard equipment in most healthcare systems. And not only that, case radiography can be very portable with the new types of uh, portable uh, chest x-ray systems that are available right now. So it can be performed in isolation rooms to minimize the risk of transmission doing transport to fixed systems. So instead of having patients being transferred to the actual uh, chest x-ray rooms, these portable chest x-rays can be brought directly to the patients. And this has an added advantage of being usable in rural areas. So instead of having the patient come over to the clin uh, clinic, uh, you could have the chest x-ray go over to the rural area. And not only that, it's actually quite easy to decontaminate and also prevents the spread. And finally, which is actually very important, is that chest radiography enables risk stratification, which is not possible with uh, viral testing, such as RT-PCR tests. So while those are good for determining whether somebody has the likelihood of COVID, it doesn't really give you insights on risk level as well as severity. Whereas with chest x-rays, it gives you insights into risk levels and severity, and also helps improve population management, who should be in the clinic, who shouldn't, who should be in hospitals, who shouldn't, as well as individualized care based on risk. So should they be using a... Uh, a ventilator, should they be using a uh, normal oxygen treatment, should they be at home, using chest x-rays gives you a much better idea around that. And so motivated by the uh, benefits of having uh, chest radiography as a complementary tool, what we did was we launched COVIDnet, which is a global deep learning initiative for COVID-19 detection and risk stratification for chest radiography, designed to help uh, clinicians deal with the large number of cases that they need to deal with. And so it's an open source, open access initiative, all available through our GitHub repository, and we continuously improve it with regular releases of new models and data on a very regular basis for the whole community to use. The project started as a team of two, so myself and my uh, student at the time, Linda Wei, and now it's actually been We've grown our team significantly, and now it's being used around the world, in the Americas, Europe, Asia, with lots of different contexts and global support and media coverage. So we've been very happy that it's already having a strong impact uh, in the worldwide fight against COVID-19. And so this started really as a joint initiative between my lab, which is the Vision and Image Processing Research Group, as well as uh, Darwin AI, which is a deep learning uh, AI startup at uh, Waterloo that's spun up from the University of Waterloo, focused on accelerated AI machine learning development, where we try to uh, solve the operational challenges in machine learning and AI to enable widespread adoption across industries, verticals in a scalable, and most importantly, trustworthy manner. And so the COVID net, uh, main initiative actually is comprised of um, three main initiatives. One is COVIDx, which is a open access benchmark data set. The next one is COVIDnet CXR, which is a tailored deep learning models for SARS-CoV-2 detection from chest x-ray data. And finally, we have COVIDnet Dev, which is tailored deep learning models for SARS-CoV-2 uh, severity assessment from chest x-ray data. And so what you have with our particular initiative is a fully uh, functional uh, integrated system where you have a chest x-ray. It gets analyzed using COVID-Net CXR to determine whether it's a normal case, whether it's a non-COVID detection, as well as whether it's a COVID-19 uh, infection. And in a situation where it determines that it is a COVID-19 infection, then covid net Ceph will actually analyze it and then identify severity scores associated with it. And so a bit of deeper detail, one of the key things that we had to do was really build it fast. So we needed to build COVID-Net 
at a much more accelerated pace given the urgency of the pandemic. And so we wanted to build it in less than seven days to act as a reference point for the global community to use to help drive, build upon it, use it, and drive innovation. And so the problem we had was we needed to build a custom tailored deep learning solution for a specific task with specific requirements that usually takes months to years to build, even for large enterprises. So one of the questions we had was how can a small team, two at the time, build a deep neural network that's completely tailored for COVID-19 detection in such a short time frame. And so our solution was to use a human machine collaborative design strategy where we combine human experience and expertise through human driven design guidance with machine driven design exploration and understanding. And so there's a number of key benefits. The first benefit is that it allows for accelerated scalable development beyond what a human and AI can do independently. And more importantly, especially for mission critical uh, situations involving health, is that it provides greater transparency into model design and performance for more trustworthy deep learning development and regulatory compliance. And so what we did was we leveraged a explainable design automation approach within this where we work with explainable AI itself to design highly efficient, highly accurate, highly dependable deep neural networks based on human driven design and requirements. So we're treating AI as a collaborator. And so this explainable AI learns from the operational targets and prototypes that we have and then explains to a generator to then design multiple solutions with different trade-offs. And so therefore, by iterating with AI, it allows us to rapidly build customized solutions tailored for the task at hand, as well as making sure that it's dependable and trustworthy. And this main process really involves two main phases, which I'll break down further into four main steps. So the two main phases is a principal network design prototyping, where myself and my team as humans will then develop prototypes of kind of the scaffolding on what we want. And then we let machine-driven design exploration, in this case, general synthesis, take over to develop unique machine design networks tailored around human requirements and tasks at hand. And these discover insights uh, leveraged in the machine-driven design exploration, which I'll talk about very soon, can then be surfaced for greater transparency and trust. And so there are four main steps that we took to building the COVID net initiative. The first is data collection, then design prototyping, design exploration, then finally design auditing. And then they'll go through each step. So in the first step, what we did was we did data collection. So as with many machine learning cases, what we have to do was first build up our data set. And we want to do it in the most comprehensive and diverse manner. And so what we ended up building was COVIDX, which is the largest open access data set of its kind, uh, with over 14,000 uh, chest X-ray images across from individuals from across four different continents with different views, right? Different imaging protocols, as well as different types of systems, both portable and fixed, as well as different positions. So uh, upright, serpine, so on and so forth. And so this allows us to build systems that learn from diversity and generalize better. And so the COVID-X uh, data set is comprised of a mix of normal cases, right, which are non-COVID uh, uh, in really infections and non-pneumonia infections. Then we have non-COVID-19 infections, which could be viral uh, pneumonia, fungal pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, so on and so forth. And finally, we have COVID-19 infections. And as you can see on the right, it's actually quite difficult to discern between non-COVID-19 and COVID-19 infections. And that's actually one of the key bottlenecks and pain points with leveraging chest x-rays for determining whether somebody has a COVID-19 infection or just a uh, standard uh, pneumonia infection. And that's where AI and machine learning and deep learning really shines to identify these subtleties uh, that differentiate these to help clinicians better determine. And then next, once we have the data, we start with a design prototyping process where we create a rough scaffolding for the machine to learn from. So here we design a very simple prototype consisting of residual architectures with three class softbacks output. So normal, 
non-COVID-19 infections, as well as COVID-19 infections. And then we pass this into the GenSynth machine-driven uh, machine exploration process to find the final macro architecture and micro architecture that is catered completely to this particular task at hand, which is COVID-19 detection and risk stratification. And so after we've actually created this rough scaffolding, what we do is now go into a design exploration step where we collaborate with this generous synthesis AI process to allow it to learn and generate newer, better neural networks. So what we do is we pass in the design prototype we created, we pass in the data, which is the COVID X data set, as well as what are our operational requirements that we needed to meet. Because this is for a clinical situation, we want it to make sure that it has a COVID-19 sensitivity that exceeds 80%, as well as positive predicted value that exceeds 80%. So we pass this into the generative synthesis process, which powers the machine-driven design exploration, where it'll go through different iterations and learn to build better and better neural networks for meeting our requirements. And the outcome is something actually quite interesting. So this is the COVID net architecture that was created by the uh, machine. And we can make a number of different interesting observations. One is that it has a very interesting, efficient macro architecture design that differs greatly from what we've seen before in other hand created designs. So for example, we see very selective long range connectivity. So you see these hubs of a highly uh, long range connectivity uh, without a huge amount of connectivity in between. And this allows for a nice balance between efficiency as well as modeling representation power. So what we end up with is a hand creation of unique tailored designs with different trade-offs. And in this particular case, we have a COVID net uh, architecture that is has half the complexity of your standard ResNet 50, but has 8% greater COVID-19 sensitivity. So we have much better sensitivity detection of COVID-19, yet having only half the complexity of the network. So this leads us to architecture designs that are significantly smaller and faster, significantly higher accuracy, and significantly higher COVID-19 sensitivity and positive prediction value. And so numbers look great, right? So that means the model is great, right? Well, do numbers really tell all? And so as a result, because of the way we do things, this is usually where people end. They have a great network with great numbers. What we do is we take it one step further to make sure that it's trustworthy and dependable and making the right decisions for the right reasons. And so that brings us to the fourth step, which is design auditing. So what we do is to ensure that everything's trustworthy and working well and making the right decisions for the right reasons, we then audit the model design to accelerate development. And so one thing, sometimes you might question, well, how does adding an additional step actually accelerate the development? It de accelerates the development because it allows us to identify errors and problems early on in the development stage, as opposed to iterating once we hit certain endpoints. And so in doing this, it allows us to early identify error scenarios, really understand the reliability of created models, as well as gain valuable insights on how to actually further improve the models. So by use and with how we actually do the auditing is we actually use what we call explainable AI approach to model auditing. This allows us to gain better, greater transparency so we know why it's making decisions about COVID-19 detections. We can actually gain new insights and discover critical factors that could be beneficial to clinicians. So we had situations where the explainable AI was able to explain some of the critical areas that the models have been using, and clinicians were looking at it, wow, okay, I never thought about this, but this makes sense. And of course, for performance validation. And so here you see on the right that with explainable AI, we're able to identify that the COVID net uh, model architecture was able to identify COVID-19 by looking at things that are common to uh, radiologists, which is looking at the lungs, looking at ground glass opacities, looking at uh, bilateral uh, abnormalities and so on and so forth. So because it's making decisions in a rational manner, it gives us a much greater sense of confidence. 
So then the question is, doesn't that always happen with neural networks? Doesn't it always use things that are necessary to making proper decisions? The answer is no. And that's why this design auditing really helped us early on. And so early on, what we did was we were creating our prototypes and then we wanted to see how well it works. And we were actually getting really great performance numbers. But we were a little skeptical because we wanted to kind of do an audit to see whether it's actually helpful and making right decisions for the right reasons. And the answer was our early prototypes were not. And so if you look on the left, what you see is that based on explainable design auditing, it was able to identify that some of the earlier prototypes that we built internally actually had very bad performance because it gets really high numbers, not by looking at the lungs, but by looking at text. Clearly, it's making the right decision for all of the wrong reasons. And on the right, with our work, early work on CT, again, in prototype form, we also got really high accuracy. But what we did was we threw away the network because we discovered during the design auditing process that instead of looking at the lungs, it was looking at all of the types of beds that the patients were lying on on the CT scanner. And once again, it's making the right decisions, but for all of the wrong reasons. We further expand this work into risk stratification. So in the situation where somebody has a likelihood of COVID-19, we also do a prediction on the lung severity, which is very important to help the uh, clinicians on their treatment as well as management plans. And so what we did was we built a neural network that predicted scores based on geographic extent. So how far has it spread within the lungs uh, by ground glass opacity and consolidation, as well as the degree of opacity. And this is collaboration with Stony Brook School of Medicine. And once again, we're able to create a network in a very rapid fashion and get some really good results to demonstrate the feasibility of deep learning for a computer-aided severity assessment for SARS-CoV-2 lung severity. And so that's where we're at right now. And so what's next? So we continue to release new and improved models and data on a regular basis to help provide more and more better reference points for the open community to leverage and build upon and expand. Work very closely with clinical institutes around the world to get feedback and evaluation. We're, as you will see soon see, we're building COVID net application for radiologists uh, because uh, with a lot of radiologists, they're not deep learning AI experts. And so what we're trying to do is surface this information in a way that they could better understand. We're improving and building a COVID net cloud a cloud-driven assessment platform for COVID-19. We're also trying to incorporate additional patient metadata, such as comorbidity, vital signs, blood tests, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, as related to the open community and through collaboration with uh, Red Hat, we're always looking for collaborations. And so what I'm going to do right now is turn over to Melissa to talk about our efforts in the COVID-Net application. Thank you so much for that, Alex. That was really great. Um, so, yeah, as Alex mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about COVIDnet, uh, the application, uh, what motivated us to do this, and how we're collaborating with Red Hat. So, just as Alex mentioned, um, COVIDnet has a lot of potential, but it currently can't really be used by a doctor or a clinician in a primary care setting, as these individuals don't really have the technical expertise that's required to leverage uh, an open source neural network. Um, so in order for us to get the COVID net into the hands of the people who need it the most, we needed to create a solution that could really allow clinicians to make use of its predictive capabilities, uh, but still allowing them to use it in a really simple, reliable, and easy to use manner while abstracting that technical information. Um, and that's really where we came up with this idea of creating an application or a front end interface that's designed specifically for radiologists. Um, so the idea is users can search directly by the MRN, um, they can select the images they want, um, process and view the results in a DICOM viewer, um, and they're also able to access previous results to a results dashboard. Uh, so just to kind of loop in where we've been collaborating with Red Hat on this. Um, so the front end for our COVID-Net application is something that we're, we've been developing alongside uh, with Red Hat with their collaborative and design efforts. But the back end for the application runs on a system called CRIS. So CRIS is essentially a data and an open source data and computing platform. Um, 
And it's a collaborative effort of Boston Children's Hospital and Red Hat, uh, and it's really what COVIDnet as the application runs on. So over the next couple of months, we're going to be completing our front end interface, um, and we're looking for volunteer efforts to help us not only on our back end, but also on our front end. Uh, so Alex, if you could go to the next slide, please. So here we have the create new analysis workflow. So this is just a snippet of what we've been working on from the UI. Uh, and essentially we allow um, the radiologist to search up a patient record using their MRN. And as you can see in the snippet here, uh, we have a new predictive analysis or a new um, record or, or a predictive analysis result that we're trying to create. And they can select the medical record, they can select the series uh, and the respective study images, and they can review uh, the images and submit it to the model for inferencing. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, so here we have the results dashboard. Um, so as I mentioned before, essentially the way our system runs is we have um, the COVID net models, and they're essentially packaged into containers um, or plugins rather that run on this Chris uh, engine, which is, uh, again, a collaborative project of Red Hat and Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, and what that allows us to do is the results are returned to us um, back to our front end, and then we display them as a predictive analysis result where the model can uh, essentially predict the likelihood of the individual having COVID pneumonia, um, regular pneumonia, or just being healthy. So as you can see in uh, the screenshot, um, right now the prediction for a specific image for COVID-19 is very low, but um, the prediction of them having regular pneumonia is quite high. And users can also view the previous predictive analyses across different patients. And uh, we also have two extra models, which are um, the opacity extent models and the geographic severity um, models as well. And essentially what they do is if the likelihood of an individual having COVID-19 pneumonia is very high, uh, and we predict that they will have COVID-19, uh, then the other two models, which are the geographic severity and the opacity, they're going to give um, essentially like the risk stratification as well as um, uh, the opacity of um, that patient having COVID-19. And sorry, next slide. Um, so what we're also working on uh, is a DICOM viewer, and it essentially allows the radiologist to view um, the chest X-ray in more detail. But one of the reasons we wanted to go with this approach is because Darwin AI um, currently has explainable AI technology that allows um, the user to essentially see the regions on the chest X-ray scan that the model used to make those decisions. So for example, in this uh, chest X-ray, let's say they're like these uh, cloudy or gloss-like structures um, in the chest X-ray that COVID-Net used to make the prediction of this patient having COVID-19. Um, so in, in the future, what we're going to do is enable our explainable AI technology to be used as an API in this um, in this COVID-19 application and highlight those regions for the radiologist so they can instantaneously see where those COVID-infected regions are and how that model came to this conclusion. Um, so essentially, uh, I'm going to do, uh, we were going to do a quick UI demo. Um, Alex, if you'd like, I can share my screen. Otherwise, it's essentially, let me. Yep, go ahead. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes you can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so this is just a quick UI demo that we're looking at here. Um, so essentially the user can log in. Um, they can start... Yes, okay, I can see it now. Okay. <laughs> so um, they can search by the patient MRN. Uh, here we have all of the previous predictive analyses. So here they're creating a new predictive analysis. Uh, and as you can see, as I mentioned before, it pulls up the patient medical record. Um, and there you can see all the studies in the series that belong to the patient. So here we're selecting a series. And then they can select the specific images or DICOMs rather that belong to that particular patient. Uh, they can edit them um, as they need for inferencing.
and then they're redirected to the dashboard because that's where the new result is submitted. And what we're going to do here is you can also view a particular predictive analysis and it'll take you to the dashboard. So let's say we want to view the image. Um, here we have the, the DICOM viewer. We have the traditional capabilities of zooming, panning, changing the brightness and contrast. Um, and you can even invert it. Um, and essentially, moving forward, we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to include the explainable AI capabilities within this ICOM viewer as well. That's just a little bit of uh, a, a quick sneak peek into our um, UI currently. Uh, sorry, Alex, I'm gonna need you to kind of go back, if that's possible. Yes, I'm gonna share my screen. Yes, please. Go ahead, Melissa. Yep. So, uh, in terms of planned features, um, obviously we've made a lot of progress uh, thanks to Red Hat uh, on our UI currently, but we do have a lot of features upcoming that we'd still like to integrate. So, um, what you saw right now is um, in the UI we've built currently, all of the images currently live within the Swift storage in Chris. Uh, but moving forward, we'd like to move to a fax integration so that it can be used directly within the hospital fax, uh, which is essentially like a, the hospital's like data storage of, of uh, medical records. Uh, and this way we can allow for much greater um, compatibility with a lot more hospitals and a more seamless approach uh, for radiologists to work with. Uh, also, we'd like to have multi-user authentication. Currently, we have one account, so we're looking for back-end engineers to kind of help us uh, build a much more scalable model when it comes to creating different accounts for different hospitals. We're also going to be conducting user testing with different hospitals uh, in the next couple of weeks so that they can get an idea of um, how they feel about the UI and what changes we should make. And obviously, we're going to be needing help from Red Hat um, as well as our internal team to help incorporate those changes. Um, and Alex mentioned a little bit about this before, but we'd also like to move towards cloud hosting. Um, so right now we're hosting um, on a server, but we'd like to move towards a more scalable, robust model um, that can deal with a lot of different requests from different hospitals. Uh, so we're going to be moving our, our infrastructure uh, and this CRISP backend onto uh, the either the Azure or AWS cloud and um, help us um, run in a more robust manner. And then finally, um, just a little bit about the explainable AI um, API that I mentioned before. So currently Darwin AI has um, technology for explainable AI and root cause analysis, and we'd like to include that as an API so that we can see those regions um, on the chest X-ray scan and make it easier for radiologists to make those predictions. So that's a little bit um, about our COVID net, and we'd be happy to take on uh, any questions that um, uh, anyone in the audience has for Alex or me. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. We really appreciate it. Um, if you'd like to turn your cameras on now, that would be great. Um, as we're getting that set up, um, let's get to our first question. So we have a number of them coming that came in from our, thank you so much. Harish uh, gets us started with the first question. How many countries have used this system so far? Um, yeah, so, I can add to that. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. No, go for it. Um, so currently, COVIDNet, um, the neural network, because it's open source, uh, we have obviously a lot of people constantly um, using the, the GitHub repository. And currently that we know of, uh, there have been dozens of users all across the globe. Uh, and that's just for the neural networks. Moving forward, at least for the applications, we'd like to start testing it out with hospitals. Um, we have our user testing lined up with almost 23 hospitals. And over the course of the next year or so, we're going to start slowly incorporating it in many hospitals as we can. Great. Uh, Steve asked, um, he, I am quite interested in the explainable AI. Is there an open specification that exists or is being developed? So uh, I could talk a bit more about the uh, explainable AI slide. So that's actually part of the uh, general synthesis process uh, from uh, Darwin AI to surface this information. We have a number of, uh, I guess, studies that we've done to show its efficacy compared to some of the uh, other ones available. Uh, so that's where, so right now it's still uh, in the 
uh, within the platform on their development stage uh, before it's being surfaced. And so that's why right now we're working on developing uh, APIs to allow it to be better surfaced. And so right now we're still working on specifications and so on and so forth. Okay, great, thank you. So the next question comes from Jonathan who, who says, this sounds terrific, um, but um, it seems similar to an effort from Google, um, like their Google machine learning tool that's looking at uh, x-rays and whatnot. Um, and he's asking, how does this compare to um, that specific project? And if you're not familiar with that one that he's talking about, you know, why we can roll it up to a more general question and say, how do you feel like, uh, you know, the ways in which COVIDnet is superior uh, as in its approach to this problem? So I, I kind of talk a bit about that. So uh, there's a number of things that we, th I wouldn't say superior, I would say uh, different than the approach that makes us quite unique. So one of the uh, approaches that's uh, very different with what we do is the fact that it's uh, open access, open source especially in collaboration with Red Hat. So for us, that allows the community to have a much better, clearer sense on how to use it, how to expand upon it, and great, give a greater sense of transparency because it's available to you. All the scripts and everything's available. We continue to expand upon it. So in which case, uh, I, I think we provide a much greater sense of transparency and openness and access compared to a lot of the other, uh, I guess, initiatives out there right now. The other key thing that's also very different is that we leverage a general synthesis approach to create these networks. And so in which case, uh, rather than having more of a fixed uh, backbone that's you know, common to a lot of different uh, applications, which is most of the kind of initiatives people take. We take a very custom uh, approach to building it based on domain knowledge, based on task at hand, and really incorporating operational needs for this particular task. So that's also uh, what makes us different. And last but not least, another thing that really differentiates is because we're working with the model development as well as data creation at the same time. This allows us to get a much better sense into not only how to build better models, but also how to create and create better data sources for the community to use and identify some of the caveats. So for example, using our explainability, we're able to identify certain issues with data such as embedded text and other kind of quirks here and there with the processing. And so we help deal with these uh, instead of just trying to let the machine learn around it. And as you see, in some cases, the machine just cannot learn around it and ends up uh, giving the uh, right decisions for the wrong reason. So I think transparency, openness, as well as taking a much more custom generative approach to this initiative is, uh, I think, what makes us very different and unique and I think uh, provides great impact for the community. Uh, I can also add a little bit more to what Alex said. So in addition to all of that, we also have uh, the COVIDx data set, which, is, which currently has, it's open source, and it currently has the largest number of publicly available um, COVID-19 positive images um, currently available right now, and our models have all been trained on that. Um, in addition to that, we also have an application. So in addition, like just um, apart from the regular models that we're producing, we also want to try to operationalize our system, um, unlike some of the competitors out there. And uh, by doing so, we're able to get uh, more clinicians and more radiologists um, to, to actually make use of the system. Excellent, great. Um, okay, so Max asks, are there plans to expand this model for classifying other diseases in the future? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. And so because we've already built a lot of infrastructure as well as know-how from uh, developing models for uh, COVID-19 detection, for how to better surface information to clinicians and so on and so forth, uh, one of my main, I guess, uh, long-term plans is to continue to expand it to cover a larger range of diseases. So for example, I have a lot of expertise in, let's say, oncology, like for detecting cancer, for detecting other types of disease and anomalies. So I, I would love to continue to expand this project to introduce more and more models, uh, open source, open access models and data sets to cover a wider range of disease and having them surface through the application that we've been building. Excellent. Um, so uh, Joya asks a question that's already been a little bit touched on about the expandable a, uh, AI being open, but also added, will the root cause analysis component also be open sourced? 
So uh, right now, that's actually a part of, I, I guess, the, uh, I guess, part of uh, Darwin AI's uh, platform. So uh, right now, we're thinking about the best ways to surface it. Uh, so for example, from an API perspective, we we're looking into uh, creating a more of an open API, but uh, some of the other things we're still, uh, I guess, considering. Okay. Um, Alex asks, since this is open source, can a healthcare provider run their own local instance of COVID-Net, or should it, you know, is it more efficient to run it in the hosted model? Um, uh, so, sorry. yep, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry, um, so I was just going to say, obviously, like, because it's open source, anyone can make use of the networks. Um, really, the, the question there is whether they have the time and the capabilities to do that. But obviously, again, it's open source. Um, it's there for everyone to use. Uh, and really, like, moving forward, we'd like to make, um, we, we have already made the, the UI also open source. Technically, all these tools are available. It's really for us to kind of package it up and make it into one complete cohesive solution and then provide that to the to healthcare providers. Okay, great. Um, Yoon asks, um, what is the, so this is a medical question, what's the white color part on the chest ray, chest x-ray images? Is that, you know, inflammation or, um, or something else? And, you know, and what is the difference between like a non-COVID-19 and COVID-19 infection, how does that show up on an X-ray image? And I know there are a number of other things like pneumonia and bacterial pneumonia, and also I know Legionnaire's disease presents in a similar way. Now, so how does your AI kind of track through all of those uh, subtle differences? It's a very interesting question. So uh, what, what is one of the key differentiating factors that clinicians right now use uh, to differentiate things like uh, pneumonia caused by other other types of infections as uh, versus COVID infections uh, are uh, ground glass opacities, which is some of the, the white areas that you see. It They could tell from it based on the underlying texture. Uh, another one is bilateral abnormality. So depending on certain areas of the uh, lung, it's able to identify these uh, certain uh, abnormalities that, as mentioned before, is kind of whitish but also appears in certain regions of the lungs. And so those are some key cues that people are actually leveraging right now. And what we discovered through explainable AI is that there's a lot of similarities and alignments between what the actual AI model uses and what the actual radiologist uses. Of course, there's also uh, some other uh, interesting things that the AI leverages as well, uh, based on some of the more subtle signs. So even uh, with the earlier stage uh, ground glass opacities, those are actually more difficult to see with the eye, but uh, it's able to spot some of these more subtle uh, initial infections. might help if I actually turn my mic on. So Pratiksha asks, what is the accuracy of performance of COVID-Net as compared to other generic developed models? So uh, I'll answer that particular question. So uh, uh, it's actually uh, quite good. Uh, and so there's really not too many generic models that are targeted for COVID-19. So there's been a lot of different models that have been available from a commercial perspective where their focus is not identifying for COVID-19, but identifying for lung abnormalities. So it's a little harder to compare. But if I were to talk about COVID net in general, it's able to achieve a pretty high COVID-19 uh, sensitivity. We have actually three different models with different sensitivities. Uh, as well as different PPVs, and uh, all of them are above 90% in terms of uh, sensitivity. So it's able to detect 90% of them. And of the ones that they detect, the PPV, so positive projected value is actually quite high. So it's like above 95%. So of the ones that it says is COVID, it's actually quite certain that it's COVID because uh, over 90 something percent of them are in fact really COVID-19. Okay, excellent. That's good to know. So um, I am afraid we have run through our session time today. Um, thank you all so much for uh, and asking a lot of great questions. We certainly appreciate it. 
Um, for those of you who work for Red Hat, there is a link in the chat um, highlighting the Mojo page where all of the Team 19 projects are uh, listed. Um, as an associate, you are certainly free to apply to work on any of the projects mentioned on that page, including COVIDnet, which we've outlined today. Um, for those of you outside Red Hat watching this video, um, certainly visit uh, the GitHub repository. The link will be on the YouTube page later um, and get involved in that way. So everybody can pitch in and help on this fantastic open source project. And we're all excited uh, that you are you know, able to respond to this so quickly. So Alex and Melissa, thank you so much for coming on and walking us through uh, COVIDnet. It's really fascinating stuff. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, I thank you for everyone for listening. And I hope everyone stays safe, especially in these uh, trying times. Thank you so much for having us. Excellent. And with that, we're wrapping up another edition of Community Central. Um, take care. We will be back next week highlighting another uh, Team 19 project. And as Alex and Melissa said, everyone, please be safe out there and take care. Good day.